15 minute or less lecture series, Human Anatomy, Chapter 10, Muscle Tissue. There are three kinds of muscle tissue, skeletal muscle tissue, cardiac muscle tissue, and smooth muscle tissue. Uh, skeletal muscle tissue is obviously found in the main muscles of the body attached usually to bones to allow for movement. These cells are long, long, super long cylindrical cells that are striated, have a dark light pattern along the length of the cells. They are multinucleated and they are controlled primarily voluntarily. The cardiac muscle tissue is found only in the heart. These cells are much shorter than the skeletal muscle cells, but they're still sort of columnar, although they do branch. They tend to have only one nucleus per cell, and they do have the striations. Also, they have intercalated discs, these uh, dense areas where uh, cell-to-cell -cell junctions form to connect the cells to each other. And then smooth muscle tissue is found in the walls of hollow organs. It is a uh, Smooth because there is no striations in these cells. They are small cells, uh, often uh, spindly shaped, tapering off the ends, and only have one nucleus per cell. Uh, functions of the muscle tissue include producing body movement, stabilizing the body's position, moving substances within the body, and producing heat. Uh, properties of muscle tissue include electrical excitability. They will respond to a stimulus, primarily from some sort of neuron, and that will lead to the generation of an electrical within the muscle's membrane called the uh, muscle action potential. A contractility, muscles are able to shorten. That is what they do, the only thing they do, and it generates a force that will pull on attachment points or do some other uh, way of moving substances. Uh, extensibility, they are able to stretch without being damaged, and elasticity, they can return to the original size and shape after being stretched. Uh, muscle organ has the belly, the muscle belly, the main portion of where the cells are, with a tendon that will attach the muscle, skeletal muscle, to a bone or to skin. Uh, if you look at a muscle organ, you will see that it is uh, made up of uh, bundles of cells called fascicles. So fascicles have many, many muscle cells within them. If you look at a fascicle, you see that there are many muscle cells called muscle fibers. And if you look at the muscle fibers, you see within them these long columns of protein structures called myofibrils, all bundled up in the muscle fiber. And if you look at the myofibrils, you see they are made up of bundles of protein filaments. We have bundles of bundles of bundles of bundles. Also found within the muscle organ is a neurovascular bundle with the blood vessels and uh, somatic motor neurons. There is connective tissue around various layers of the muscle organ. You have epimycium, a thick, dense, irregular connective tissue structure surrounding the entire organ. You have paramycium, dense, uh, irregular connective tissue surrounding the fascicles. And then the endomycium, the um, uh, connective tissue surrounding the individual muscle fibers. Um, turns out that all of these layers of connective tissue will end up fusing to form the tendon. And then the tendon will become continuous to the periosteum around the bones. And a matter of fact, collagen fibers from the tendon will penetrate into the bone itself. Uh, the connective tissue is there because it helps to limit extensibility so the muscles don't overstretch. It helps to bind muscle fibers together so that they work as a group. Also allows for limited movement within the muscle organs so that different fascicles can contract or relax at the same time. And of course, connects the muscle to the bone. Uh, when skeletal muscle fibers start off, they start off as these stem cells called myoblasts. Over time, these myoblasts will fuse and form really long uh, skeletal muscle Cells. This is why the skeletal muscle cells are multinucleated. They have the nucleuses from all those myoblasts that fuse together. Uh, if you look at the muscle fiber, you see that the plasma membrane has been renamed. It is now called the sarcolemma. The cytoplasm is now called the sarcoplasm, and it has high concentrations of glycogen and myoglobin. Myoglobin, a uh, red a uh, protein that binds oxygen and glycogen along chains of glucose molecules. And then, of course, the myofibrils, those protein columns that act as a contractile element. They are what causes the muscle fiber to get shorter. Um, here's just another view with the sarcolemma, the myofibrils, uh, lots and lots of mitochondria and skeletal muscle fibers, and, of course, multiple nucleuses. Um, some of the sarcolemma forms a tunnel or invagination into the body of the uh, muscle fiber that goes, this uh, structure is called a transverse tubule, and these transverse tubules go around the myofibrils. They are tunnels, so the inside of them are filled with the same fluid found outside of the muscle fiber. 
Uh, also found within the muscle fiber is the sarcoplasmic reticulum. These specialized organelles encircle the myofibrils and store calcium ions, which is very important. Uh, you can see that the ends or terminal cisternes of two different uh, sarcoplasmic reticuli abut the transverse tubule. This uh, three structure thing is called a triad. Now, of course, the muscle fiber will only contract when it receives stimulus from the somatic motor neuron. Uh, when a nerve impulse reaches the end, the axon terminal of the uh, motor, somatic motor neuron, it'll be arriving at what's called a neuromuscular junction because you have the axon and the neuron and the muscle fiber. So taking a close look, the um, nerve impulse arrives at the very end of the neuron called the synaptic end bulb. This synaptic end bulb is filled with vesicles filled with the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. When the neural impulse arrives, calcium ion pumps uh, channels will open, allowing calcium ions to flood into the synaptic end bulb. They will then bind to the synaptic vesicles, leading to the exocytosis of the acetylcholine into the space called the synaptic cleft. The space separates the uh, synaptic end bulb from the uh, sarcolemma of the muscle fiber. The specialized area of the sarcolemma where the neuromuscular junction is formed is called the motor end plate of the muscle fiber. So the acetylcholine is released into the synaptic cleft. It diffuses across. It will bind to acetylcholine binding receptors. These receptors, when bound to acetylcholine, will open sodium ion channels. Sodium ions positively charged will flood into the muscle fiber. And if enough of these channels are opened and enough sodium ions enter, you will generate what's called a muscle action potential, which is a change in charge across the membrane from the opening and closing of ion channels that can then move along the sarcolemma, along the membrane. Uh, eventually, the signal is going to end. There'll be no more acetylcholine being uh, released into the synaptic cleft. And then a uh, enzyme will go and break down the acetylcholine, and this will end the generation of the muscle action potential. However, while it's being generated, we see that, okay, here we have the motor end plate uh, where enough sodium chloride ion channels are opened from the acetylcholine binding, leading to a change in charge at this portion of the membrane. This will then trigger the next region of the sarcolemma, the next region of the membrane, to change its charge, and then this will pass then trigger the uh, membrane after it to open up its ion channels and have a change in its charge. And so move down along the sarcolemma, along the length of the muscle fiber, sort of like a wave motion in a stadium. Okay, so we have the muscle action potential traveling along the sarcolemma. Eventually, it'll go down the transverse tubule. When it goes down to the transverse tubules, it'll eventually reach those triads where it will be abutting the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Sarcoplasmic reticulum will then detect this change in charge and release its calcium ions into the sarcoplasm. And this is important because it's the triggering a uh, release of the calcium ions that lead to the myofibril shortening and the contraction of the muscle fiber. Um, so myofibrils are made up of two kinds of uh, protein filaments, thick filaments and thin filaments. And they are arranged in units called sarcomeres. So here is a sarcomere made up of thin filaments and thick filaments. If you look at the arrangement of a sarcomere, you see it has structures at its ends called the Z-disc that then attach it to the next sarcomeres neighboring it. And in the very middle is an M-line. Thick filaments attached to the M-lines, thin filaments attached to the Z-disc. In order to name everything possible, we see that the region are that possesses a thick filament is called the A-band. The region that only has thin filament is called the I-band, and regions that only have thick filaments is the H-zone. So the thick filament is made up of the protein myosin. It's a contractile protein that'll bind to actin and pull it the thin filaments toward the M-line. Then we see the thin filament is actually made of three proteins. You have actin, which is a contractile protein that has a binding site for myosin. You have tropomycin, a regulatory protein that covers that binding site, and troponin, a regulatory protein that binds to calcium ions. When troponin binds to calcium ions, it will then change its shape, moving the tropomycin, freeing up the binding sites on actin, allowing myosin to bind to actin. 
So this leads to the contraction cycle. Uh, first thing that happens when those binding sites are uh, opened up is that um, myosin will change its shape. It'll break down ATP into ADP, preparing it to bind to the actin. Then the myosin will bind to the actin, forming a cross bridge, a physical connection between the thin filaments and the thick filaments. Uh, it will then release its ADP and engage in what's called the power stroke, moving the thin filaments toward the end line, thereby shortening the length of the sarcomere. Uh, and then the myosin proteins will bind to ATP, allowing it to release the thin filaments, release a, uh, actin. And then this whole thing starts over again with the breakdown of ATP into ADP and phosphate, resetting the shape of the myosin so that we can continue the cycle over and over and over again, the contraction cycle. Will continue as long as there's plenty of ATP and calcium ion levels are high enough in the sarcoplasm. So here again is the uh, sarcomere. At rest, when the muscle is relaxed, we have, as we expect, the H zone, the I bands, and of course the A bands. As the muscle starts to contract, the thick filaments will, uh, myosin will pull the thin filaments toward the M line. This will shorten the H zone and the I band. They will get smaller as the sarcomere gets smaller. Eventually, you'll get a fully contracted muscle where there is no I band and no H zone. The uh, sarcomere is now at its smallest possible length, which is basically the length of one thick filament. This is sliding filament theory. The filaments slide across each other to lead to the shortening of the sarcomere, which shortens the myofibrils, which leads to the shortening of the muscle fibers and muscle itself. Eventually, the contraction will end when the sarcoplasmic reticulum stops, re stops releasing calcium ions. It will then bring in the calcium ions into itself, storing those ions and reducing the amount of calcium in the cell. Muscle contraction types. You have isotonic contraction. This is when the tension is constant and the muscle changes in length. So you're moving an object. This can be concentric. The muscle shortens as it moves an object or eccentric, the muscle is lengthening, but this is a controlled lengthening allowing you to lower an object without dropping it. Isometric contractions, on the other hand, are where there is plenty of tension and force being generated, but the muscle does not change its length. Uh, the three main types of muscle, skeletal muscle fibers, slow oxidative fibers, which are kind of reddish in color. They have lots of myoglobin, ATP, uh, mitochondria, capillaries. They can contract continuously, but they don't have a lot of power. Fast oxidative glycolytic fibers are sort of pinkish. They're in the intermediate state. They can make stronger contractions and for a little bit longer, but they can't do it as continuously as long as the slow oxidative fibers. And then the white fibers, the fast glycolytic fibers, they have very low myoglobin, low ATP, large diameter. They can produce a lot of force, but only for a short period of time, and then they can't function until they get a rest. Uh, exercise can cause fast glycolytic fibers to turn into fast oxidative, glycolytic, uh, fast oxidative glycolytic fibers, the pink ones. Uh, and rapid exercise training can cause muscle fibers to get wider, to hypertrophically get bigger without producing new fibers. Skill, uh, cardiac muscle tissue has short cells, autorhythmicity. They can contract on their own. They're involuntarily controlled. They have no epimysium, and they do have the intercalated discs, as you can see here with gap junctions and desmosomes. Smooth muscle tissue, as long as some short tapering cells, one nucleus, they are involuntarily controlled. They do have autorhythmicity. They only have endomycium, very little sarcoplasmic reticulum, no T-tibials, no striations. They contract by having their uh, thick and thin filaments arranged in a scattered method throughout the cell. The thin and thick filaments attach to intermediate filaments of the cytoskeleton, which attach to dense bodies in the uh, uh, plasma membrane. And then this causes a contraction, a shortening of the cell when they are triggered to shorten, but it's slower and doesn't generate as much force. There are two main arrangements of smooth muscle fibers. Either they're all connected together and they need only one signal and gap junctions between them will pass the signal along, or each individual muscle fiber needs its own neuron to attach to it to cause it to contract. Over time, we get less muscle tissue. It gets replaced with connective tissue, very crappy. And some disorders include muscle cramps, too much excitement, excited motor end plate overuse, causing slight tearing, muscular dystrophy, a series of disorders that lead to a breakdown of muscle tissue, and by myofascial pain syndrome, where inflammation in the connective tissue of the muscles can cause extreme pain when touched. 